Hey everybody, this is Heidi Muma over at Charles River Labs in Reno, Nevada, and I am super excited to talk to you guys about a little bit of a different topic than I'm normally used to talking about. So I'm not going to be talking about training, I'm actually going to be talking about compassion fatigue and a great way to sort of build a resiliency building program. Now this is super important for any type of animal behavior program, and so I'm coming from a lab world, but I'm hoping that you guys can find ways to apply this in any sort of animal care facility um, that you may be working in. So I really wanted to stress that resilience is very different from being numb. So it means that you actually are experiencing, you're feeling, you fail, you hurt, you might even fall, but you're going to keep going. So that is a really important thing to realize when we are talking about resiliency building. So let's talk about some definitions since we tend to get a little bit muddy with the difference between these two. So what is compassion? Well, compassion is to suffer together or to be aware that there is an, some sort of distress and not only that, but have the desire to alleviate that distress. Now resiliency is the ability to adapt to difficult situations and then the capacity to recover quickly from those difficult situations. So what we want in our team members is actually compassion resilience, right? So what is that? Well, the ability to maintain our physical, emotional, and mental well-being while compassionately caring for those who are suffering. So we all take care of animals here in this industry, so that automatically has the chance to lead us to a world of compassion fatigue. And we really want to have a nice, robust compassion resiliency within our staff to sort of be able to combat that. We are in luck. So not only is compassion an intrinsic or some type of instinct, but it can actually be taught. It can be learned. It can be nurtured. So we have a great opportunity here to be able to sort of cultivate um, a great compassion resiliency within our team. So let's talk about where sort of the thoughts on compassion fatigue sort of started. So the origins, I would like to suggest, sort of started here, right? Basically being told just to suck it up. If you talk to any of our um, parents or some of the older generations, um, you know, suck it up, buttercup, be tougher, um, tough, suffer through it, um, just keep moving. Eventually, we started getting to this, and they started sort of recognizing um, that there was some sort of burnout happening. Not that they were going to do anything about it, but there was some sort of um, sort of recognition that maybe it, uh, maybe there was something to it. All right, now we're getting to the point where, mm, yep, there probably is something here that needs to be looked at, um, but we're still not really gonna take any big steps to sort of address any issues. All right, so now we're getting to the point where it's recognized that there is an issue, there's some compassion fatigue happening, um, and that we wanna do something about it, right? It's okay not to be okay. So we're recognizing there's an issue and we wanna take steps forward to sort of work on this issue. Next, I think that uh, we sort of went into this world. Everyone had a plan. It was a good plan. Maybe it was even the best plan. Um, and I suggest that's great. I think having a plan is a great first step. But I'm gonna suggest here that maybe the plan that we all started with isn't the best plan to keep moving forward. We've learned more and we know better ways to sort of manage these issues. I would like to suggest that most resiliency plans stop at connection to self. So everyone that's got a resiliency building plan, they probably have a really robust plan on getting their employees to connect to their selves. Well, I would suggest that the issue here is that it requires personal responsibility, right? So we can give all of the different resources in the world that we want to our employees, but it's up to them to sort of use them, right? To take advantage of them. So if they're not gonna take that next step, it doesn't matter how much work we put into um, giving them the resources, it's not gonna be as effective. So here's my connection recipe. It's got three different um, sections. So first off, of course, we will focus on connection to self. 
I think that's really, really important and it is a very effective way to work on resiliency building. But I also want people to build a really nice connection to the work in research, and I, you'll see this later in the presentation, this can maybe sometimes be a little bit of a disconnect, um, maybe not so much in a zoo and aquarium world. And then of course, connection directly to the animals. Um, some people might not be working directly with the animals, and they might not know or be educated about all of the animals. So there's a lot of different aspects that we can sort of focus on. So this is my connection recipe, connection to self, connection to the work, connection to the animals, and hopefully out the bottom, we're gonna get a nice um, uh, resiliency building program. So as I said, I'm coming from the research world and there's gonna be a lot of different sort of possible triggers that might be um, present in the zoo and aquarium. But you can see those first top two bullets are the same, right? So we're all caring for animals in captivity that comes um, with its own level of compassion fatigue. We are dealing with public opinion with um, working with animals in captivity, but then the differences sort of come. So in my world, we're gonna be working in high animal numbers. We've got a uh, possibility of high uh, number of animal loss. Sickness might be expected depending on what sort of uh, medicine that we are working on. Um, the caging is gonna be a much more sparse environment than um, you're used to working maybe in the zoo and aquarium. And then of course, many of the employees that actually work at the company are not working directly with the animals, let's say like the lab techs or the study directors. Um, that's gonna be compared to the zoo and aquarium world. You guys um, have relatively lower animal numbers uh, but for you, loss of animals, you might have a more intense bond with or worked with for a much longer time. Um, and then of course your enclosures are a much more varied uh, environment, hopefully. So there's a lot of big differences here, but I would um, love to suggest that you still can take away some of the ideas that we have here to improve your compassion fatigue program. So let's start with connection to self. So here at Charles River Reno, we have a Reno um, resiliency building team. And this is basically just a group of people um, that have decided to make themselves available, to listen, help support um, their coworkers as issues arise, um, promote resiliency and self-care, and build a global network to share ideas and solutions. So this is a team that meets regularly, gets together to um, come up with new ways to sort of um, offer resources to uh, the rest of our employees. Some of the ways that we sort of reach out is this is an example of a going home um, checklist that we sent to everyone. It's something that we printed out and laminated and made it the size to fit in everyone's badges so they can sort of check in with themselves at the end of the day um, and hopefully sort of set themselves up for success while they're leaving work. Sometimes we'll send out email blasts just to make sure that um, you know people realize that the re resiliency building team is there, available for them, and just sort of you know uplifting um, the work environment. So Wellness Wednesday is a super fun event that we've been doing for the last few years, and it's an event that we do site-wide, and it really focuses on physical well-being, mental well-being, financial well-being. It's a really um, well-rounded program, and it's just an opportunity to get people out having fun and really thinking about their wellness. So some of the events that we had were pie eating contests. Uh, we had a big blow-up um, sort of thing that people would run through and race race each other, we did minute to win it games. Um, ooh, this is super fun, this is a smash tent. If you've ever been to a place where you get to, you know, smash things to let off some steam. We got smart this year and actually did a um, smash tent into the garbage can. So people were, um, had the opportunity to smash a lot of different glass items into that trash can, blow off some steam if they need to. Um, this is a fun arts and crafts, we're nice and calming. We brought some dogs on site, so that was really fun. People, of course, love the dogs, interact with the dogs. And then even a blind book swap. So there's a lot of opportunities here to um, sort of get lots of different people to participate in a wellness event and focus on their wellness. 
So this next thing is something that took a few years to build um, and get sort of approved, but it's been super exciting for us. Now this is our wellness room. It's a place where people can come. We've got massage chairs set up. We've got places to meditate, place to read, to color. So if someone is really having a tough day or just needs to sort of, um, you know, relax, this is a place where people can come um, and really focus on their wellness and um, sort of relaxing uh, and getting out of their, their workspace a little bit. So of course I could go on and on about all of the different self-care options that we could send out to your people, but like I said, I think this is where people do a really good job. So just a couple other suggestions, of course, do compassion fatigue training with your employees. And make it specific. So if they're leaders, that's a different training than if you're an employee. Um, the different departments may or may not be working with the animals in, um, in, in different ways or have different types of compassion fatigue that they need to be working on. So make that training specific if you can. Um, some other suggestions might be to um, have really good communication about a crashing study. Of course, that's research related, but maybe we're going to be doing really nice communication about loss of a favorite animal um, at your facility. So a couple more suggestions for um, for really good self-care program. Of course, I have to give a huge shout out to um, Graze. Graze is specific for my aquarium and zoo people. They are growing resiliency for aquarium and zoo employees, and they have lots of different um, sort of options to help you guys with raising awareness, sharing ideas, resources, and tools about um, growing resiliency. So check them out if um, you haven't, and I'm sure most of you guys got to see their amazing talks at our last ABMA meeting. So let's switch over to getting people connected to the work. So here's a couple of things that we're going to do in our environment. We're going to let the staff know what therapies they're working on in real time. We're also going to connect employees to the patients of those therapies. We're going to connect the suppliers to the therapies and update them on their favorite animals. And we're also going to celebrate um, Biomedical Research Awareness Day, or BRAD. And hopefully all the zoo people and aquarium people are aware of the different options they have for their days to celebrate. So typically this is the information we see when working in the research world. It's a whole bunch of numbers and the numbers don't really mean anything to us, right? So what I suggest that we do is give people much more connection to those. So we're gonna change those numbers during the study into the actual sort of diseases that they're focusing on, right? So you're not just working on study one, two, three, four, five, six, you're working on a study for melanoma. It gives you a much more um, direct connection with that study. So that's during study. We're going to let people know exactly what they're working on. Now, after study, we're going to go further and tell them what those drug names were and then even give them a connection to some of the patients. So make the, the stories and the connections with those patients are really, really important for people in research to be able to connect um, and have really nice compassion resiliency uh, with the work that they do. So we're gonna take that same concept and apply it to the vendors that we get our animals from. So in research, you're actually usually getting your animals from very specific vendors. And for the people that work at those vendors, they're just sending their animals off to the different sites under a PO number and they never hear anything else about those animals. So that connection sort of ends there. But what we've been doing and it has been really, really effective in bringing lots of smiles to people is giving them that connection um, to what sort of therapies they're working on. So what study type, whether it's multiple myeloma or melanoma, um, amniodosis. So telling them, hey, you send us this group of animals and this is the study these guys are going to be heroes and working on. Not only that, we ask them to tell us, hey, did you have any favorite animals that were in this group? And they might say, yeah, Fred came on that group. And so what I would do is actually give them personalized updates on Fred. So Fred is socialized, he's doing great with his habituations, and he also loves PB&Js. And we do that for every single favorite animal they send us so they can maintain that connection um, and 
realize exactly how important the work they are doing does to sort of uh, move us forward in creating these amazing therapies. So celebrating Biomedical Research Awareness Day or BRAD in the research world is a really nice opportunity to get people, um, you know, really aware not only in you know, the environment you work in, so within your facility, but also within the community. So we are really um, asking people to reach out to the community, work with them, educate them on the work that we're doing. Um, in the pictures here, you can see some of the different events we did this year. We took an opportunity to teach people about the different types of food that we give the animals um, in the vivarium. Um, on that far right hand side, that is the winner of our animal ma mascot from 2023, um, from earlier this year. So that's actually one of our retired beagle friends. Um, we had a competition where people got to vote. They donated money um, for the animal that they wanted to be the uh, mascot of the year. And that was our winner. So it's a really great opportunity to get people sort of aware and talking about the, the work that we do. For your zoo and aquarium folks, there are plenty of days for you to celebrate as well. I'm sure you're aware. We've got Zoo Awareness Day, National Zookeeper Week. We've got World Nature Conservation Day, Earth Day. Um, the list goes on and on. So find opportunities to celebrate the work that you're doing with your employees. So that was our connection to the work. Let's switch over to connection to the animals. And here's a couple of ways that we do it here at Charles River Reno. We're gonna give employees opportunities to interact in a meaningful way with the animals. We're gonna educate our employees about the species and their care. We're gonna allow the employees to develop relationships with the animals and to say goodbye and mourn loss when necessary. And then I really, really, uh, pressure people to be the best storytellers ever for your animals. So that's sort of our game plan. The main way that I facilitate this is through a program that I developed called Critter Connections. Now this basically has a mission to bridge the gap between our non-vivarium personnel, so animal facing personnel, um, and the animals within the facility. So we have lots of people that do not work directly with the animals that have to make lots of decisions um, for their care and for you know sort of their study um, design. And so I really wanna make sure that I'm making that connection between those folks and the animals. We're also giving them the opportunity to provide staff uh, with a better understanding of how we care for our animals while providing the animals with extra enrichment. So we're getting people uh, in the vivarium with our animals, interacting, giving them treats, doing human interaction sessions. Um, and at the same time, we are acclimating our animals um, to human interaction as well. This is gonna help us lay the important foundation of trust between the animals and the staff for future study activities. So this is sort of the baseline um, interactions that not only help the animals, but of course are having this great positive interaction um, for the humans as well. So basically our goal is to connect our employees to our animals in a positive way. And that is um, the amazingness of our Critter Connection program. Some of the other things that Critter Connection does is have what we call our treat parties. So here you can see this was a 4th of July sort of theme treat party or a barbecue treat party. So I always like to point out those pictures. Um, they look like uh, chicken wings, but they're actually actually like no bake cookies with some sort of yogurt and mixture to make it brown and they, it looks pretty spot on. They did a really good job. People have tons of fun. They love making, you know, these really extravagant treats for the animals. And then of course they get the opportunity to hand them out as well. So that's been a really fun program for people. We also have toy creation labs. And what this allows people to do is stretch their imagination. So um, we give them all kinds of sort of, um, you know, pieces, PVC, chain, you know, all, all the different things and allow the people themselves to create a toy they think the animal um, might find uh, fun and entertaining. Now, of course, you know, I caution afterwards, we're checking and making sure that it is safe and vetting everything. But this is a really fun way for people to start to think about um, animal behavior, 
you know, how the animal is going to interact with their toys and just get getting people sort of more interacting with the behavior program than they normally would. I have to say that this is the most popular new addition to our program, and this is giving a monkey a valentine. So what you're seeing here is edible wafer paper that will cause no harm to your animals. And we use edible scented markers and allowed people to write um, different valentines, draw pictures to the animals, and then we handed them out to the monkeys. So people loved this. They loved seeing the pictures of it. Um, the monkeys, of course, loved it. So this has been a really fun, easy, cheap addition to create a nice connection with our animals. Now, painting with animals has been a pretty popular thing that's been happening in zoos and aquariums um, for a long time, but not so much in the research world. So at a previous ABMA uh, conference, I actually learned a technique that I brought back with me and my team has just taken off with it. So we have paintings with the animals all over the facility to help bond people with the animals that we have. Um, we create uh, Christmas ornaments to give out to employees. We offer it as an opportunity for people to come with us in the back, interact with the animals, um, and get a painting. So it's been a really, really fun and um, popular program for us. As I said, we have it all over the facility, so it's always within someone's eyesight, um, eyeline to be seeing that, yes, there's animals here, and um, we interact with them in a positive way. Another focus of our connection to the animals is educating people about the species and their care. So unlike maybe the zoo or aquarium, we do have a lot of people here in the company that might not be working directly with the animals. So we'd love to send out little blasts, maybe teaching people about what an ischial callosity is, teaching people about our different types of enrichment. Here you can see um, something I sent out about recycling um, construction helmets. I didn't know that they expired. I'm not sure if you do, um, but they do. And they make great swings for primates and probably lots of other animals as well. And people get a kick out of that. So make sure you're um, getting out there and teaching people about the species that you're working with. A couple more opportunities to teach people about the species you're working with. We've done crosswords puzzles for people to um, to do and learn about the species. We've sent out um, something we called Messy Monkey Mondays that taught people different enrichments that we are using with the animals. Here you can see our monkeys interacting with Aquasol paper, which is a fabulous dissolvable paper that will not um, clog the drains and is a great destructible enrichment for our animals. So historically in the research world, we were pushed to maybe not name our animals or to not develop as close of a bond with our animals. Uh, and we're gonna go the opposite way with this now. We're actually gonna you know, ask people, name those animals, pay tribute to them, thank the animals for all of the contributions that they've done. So here you can see an example of some of the tribute treats that we have created for our animals. This is gonna be something that they are gonna get at the end of their study something bigger than they normally would get. And it's really just to thank them, pay tribute for all of the amazing work that they've done for us. We also have these large chalk walls around the facility. This is another opportunity for people to sort of thank their favorite animals um, and communicate between each other uh, in a fun, fun way and sort of help with that resiliency building. I cannot stress enough that you need to be the best storytellers for your animals. And I know when people in zoo and aquarium worlds are interacting with the public, you guys are the best storytellers ever. So do that with your employees. Make sure you're taking every opportunity to create that amazing story to help create that bond and connection uh, with the animals. So what you're seeing here um, is an honorary silent auction that we do for two of our monkeys, Blondie and Dagwood, that were retired. And basically this is something that happens yearly. We get to tell the story of Blondie and Dagwood and we're raising money to um, sort of maintain them in their retirement sanctuary 
uh, that they will live out the rest of their lives in. So get that story out, get those connections going with your employees. Another opportunity we had for storytelling was to announce to the company that we had rare cinemologous macaque twins born. Now, as I said, that's rare and we decided to celebrate it. So we did that with a baby shower. We collected gifts to donate to a local group. We also had a naming contest. So we asked people to give us um, their names for the, the two twins, and then we got to all vote for it and, and pick a name. And so another awesome opportunity to really connect people with our animals through great storytelling. So of course, this has been a bit research heavy, so I wanted to throw out a few suggestions for the zoo and aquarium folks. Um, and that is to really, you know, sort of announce your conservation success stories. Um, get them out there. Let them know that the work you're doing um, is effective um, and important, of course. Uh, tell your training success stories. You know, not everyone works in the tortoise department. So make sure you're getting that out there to the rest of the groups and really celebrating those. Um, that's a picture of my old team at Wegg Bowl. Uh, at the San Diego Zoo and they are visiting the elephant team. So go visit other animals, visit other teams, create that um, nice bond and sort of work environment. And then of course, attend conferences. I think that's one of the best ways to keep up that motivation and that excitement and really bolster that resiliency. So to button everything up, um, compassion, resiliency building programs are a necessity, I think, in our world now. And self-care is a great place to start, right? But I would love to suggest that there's so much more we can do for our staff to help build compassion, resiliency. Guys, be creative. Look for ways to connect your staff with the work, with the animals, something that you haven't thought of before. Be great storytellers for your animals. Look for those opportunities to get out there and tell those stories um, to people and help build those connections. And then last but not least, don't be afraid to let your staff build relationships with the animals and mourn loss when needed. This may or may not be an issue at your facility, but I'm telling you it is a hugely important part uh, for your staff to be able to maintain their compassion resiliency. Bottom line and more resilient staff equals better animal welfare. And that's why we're all here, right? We want the best welfare for our animals, no matter what species, no matter what facility we are talking about. So this is applicable for everyone out there. And with that, I wanna say thank you guys so much for having me. I couldn't have done this without my amazing behavior team from Charles River Reno. And thank you so much for allowing me to talk about this. I think it's so, so important. Um, go out there, enjoy creating your resiliency building programs, and you will get um, a better team and better, you know, animal management program from it. So with that, happy training. Have a great day, guys.